Hi, and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today, we welcome back on the show Marianne McCrary. She is an internal medicine physician and a physician coach, and she wrote the Kevin MD article, A Word of Advice from One Chief Resident to Another. Marianne, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Kevin, for having me back and to let me talk about my former life as a chief resident. And we'll get into that story and article in a little bit. But for those who didn't get a chance to listen to our first episode, can you just briefly share your story and journey to where you are today? I'd be happy to. So I am, as Kevin said, an internal medicine physician in North Carolina, and my practice is primary care outpatient. And I take care of folks from 18 to as old as you want to be. So there's lots of opportunities to to have conversations about expectations and different things, but I um, am now uh, practicing full-time and also doing coaching for physicians through AMWA, the American College of Physicians, and working in a role as a well-being champion for physicians. So it's been really nice to be able to, to uh, uh, do both of those. Now, I'm an internal medicine primary care physician myself, and some would say that is an all-consuming job doing primary care, but you're also having time, finding time to be a physician coach as well. So why take on that added burden? I think it's really important for, for all of us to help each other and to create this community where it's okay to talk about some of the things that may be challenging to us whether that is in our home life or in our careers, and really just having people to hold space to be able to have those conversations. So for me, I I started thinking about it in a role with the American College of Physicians and see it as a service to other physicians, just like some may be involved with advocacy in their societies or your local community. So for me, it's my way of of giving back, Mm -hmm. I would say, and helping other physicians when they need it. I know a lot of physicians are interested in getting into the coaching space. So give us a sense of what a typical week would be and how your responsibilities, both as a coach and a primary care physician, how they intertwine during the week. Yeah, it can be it can be very different for different individuals. So I'm I practice full time. And so the time that I work on some of my coaching work and and things that I do with the societies is usually time that I spend in the evening or on the weekends. And sometimes there are days uh, that I have administrative time that I'm able to do that as well. Like we're recording on a morning time uh, during the work week. But it's really, again, it's, it's something I'm passionate about. And so it would be time that I would be spending possibly doing other things that I enjoy. So I don't see it as a something that takes away my time. It's something that's very valuable. There are some physicians who work uh, in medicine part-time and then are doing their coaching part-time. And there are some physicians who are coaches who have transitioned and are coaches full-time. So it really just depends on uh, what works for them. All right. So let's transition now into the recent Kevin Emery article that you wrote. It's titled, A Word of Advice from One Chief Resident to Another. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read that article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why I decided to write it? Yeah, it it actually kind of came up uh, based on a Twitter conversation I was having with uh, a former intern who went on to be a chief resident in the program that we were in, and then is now a program director. And as people were kind of thinking, oh gosh, the new residents are coming. There are lots of tweets about that uh, time. And he said, I, I had a memory that one of my chief residents had said to me, if you're unhappy in residency, you just need to adjust your expectations. And he you know, was saying, well, that's kind of a mixed bag of advice. And, and I put a little tweet back and said, that wasn't me, was it? I didn't think I said that. He said, no, and he gave the other name, but it made me start thinking of, you know, is that good advice or bad advice or both? And so I started writing it out and thinking, you know, what would I say to myself now? And what would I have said back when I was a chief resident years ago? Um, Because my mindset's very different. And so my first thought when, if somebody would have said that to me, you know, gosh, 
it, it's um, you just have to change your your expectations if you're not happy here. It sounds like I've done something wrong mm-hmm. um, that I I haven't shown up the way that I was supposed to. It just felt really bad. But then as I started to think about it now, kind of in the mindset I have, it's like, well, who's really responsible for my happiness? So is that my program? If I was a resident, you know, my program director, is are, are they in charge of my happiness? Or does it really come down to me? And can I adjust how I think about things, my mindset, my expectations, um, and really see things a little bit differently so that I can create a space with whatever I'm doing in my life that makes me feel uh, that I'm happier or I'm, I'm in charge of this space. And so when you come into residency, there are some things that you feel like you don't have control over. Mm-hmm. I remember as a chief resident, um, before my interns came in and, and kind of before the year started, it was our job to make the full schedule for the whole year. So we were telling these interns when they came in, here's your week of vacation. Here's your next week of vacation. Here's where you're going to be on call. So it was already mapped out. So it was like coming into that, we'll say the military, as some people compare residency and, and military training. And just that, you know, you don't have any control over this. And so that coming into a space like that, you really can start to feel, oh my gosh, you know, uh, I just have to kind of fall in line, do what they tell me, you know, they really do have all this control over me. And I wanted folks to maybe think about it a little bit differently. So in the article, I brought up four scenarios and, and just talked about them in ways that people could have different expectations of the time they spend in residency Mm -hmm. um, to see if it would help serve them a little bit better. All right. So why don't we go into those four scenarios that some people go into residency with and what's the response to each of those scenarios? Yeah, I would love to. So the first one is we think we need to be the absolute best. Uh, We have these expectations of ourselves that we have to be perfect all the time. And that's, you know, part of how we got to where we were in residency. We, we were the folks that showed up, did the hard work, went through everything. And so as you start to think about all the different responsibilities that you have, I challenged the expectation and said, you know, well, maybe you don't have to be getting A++ in everything that you do. And how do you actually say, this is going to be the priority that I want to put most effort into, but this one maybe not as much. And people will talk about doing B plus or B minus work, um, but actually doing a good job. It may be something that you can put less effort into and, and not have to feel like you're overwhelmed with that. Mm -hmm. I left folks with the caveat of, you know, it's probably not patient care that you want to spend a B minus work on, but maybe you don't have to write uh, the best note every time you write a note. And I think as people start to realize there's, there's a little bit of room there and um, of getting things done. um, What do they say? Uh, Perfection is the enemy of done or Mm -hmm. (laughs) something like that. I may be messing up the quote, but it's really just, you know, getting things done um, is what's important during that time. And then the other piece, the second piece uh, goes back to this arrival fallacy or heaven's fallacy that you're going to sacrifice during this time to get to whatever's beyond the residency graduation. So when you get to be an attending, it'll all be better. So I can spend three years or four years or however long your residency is and just um, grind through it, plow through it and not enjoy any of it, you know, and, and it'll be all worth it when it's over. And I really wanted to change that expectation and say, you know what, this is, this is a large chunk of your life, Mm -hmm. you know, enjoy the journey as you go, find what makes you happy during this time, because you want to be able to look back on it and remember it, uh, remember it in a positive way. And it not just be the time that you spend in the hospital, um, or in the clinic. And then the, the third and the fourth, um, are a little bit different and kind of the third one goes back to that, sense of not having control over anything and how you spend your time. And I think that that does get better. uh, The more experience that you have in residency and the comfort level that you have with the, with the system and what you're doing day to day. 
But I would encourage folks to not give up on all the things that that make them happy. And so the example I used in the article was, you know, for some people, they feel like I can't go to the gym. I can't get in my exercise routine. But if you're able to change that expectation of, you know, what used to be for me to feel like I exercised, it needed to be, you know, five hours a day. Mm -hmm. for an extreme, but maybe I could still feel like I'm getting an exercise that's valuable for me if I get in 20 minutes, three times a week. So kind of changing that expectation of what your upper limit or your lower limit might be for you to be able to do all the things that you want to do, whether that's spend time with your kids while you're in residency or travel to see friends, that you can get those things done. You may just not be doing them on the frequency that you've been used to before you're heading into med school and residency. And the last one is my expectation when I went into residency is I would kind of follow the rules. I would do it in the time allowed. I, I would just kind of follow the plan. And for a lot of people, that's not what they need. There may need to be some more exploration in residency. It may need to have some time where you do something else in the middle of it and then come back to it. And so I wanted to leave people with the thought that you can change it up. You can make it what you want. And I thought about this. I heard on um, a podcast, it was an interview with a physician who had actually taken some time off to train to be in the Olympics. And they were talking about what normally would took four years to get through med school, took them like seven. Mm -hmm. But they had all these different things they did in their life in between. And here they were in the same place, you know, in residency now. And so it's just to think you can be creative during this time. You can get out of it what you want. Um, so those were four expectations that I realized may be valuable for folks to think about differently as they're in their residency time and for chief residents possibly to, to have these uh, words of wisdom that they could give their trainees as they work through their, their training. We're talking to Marion McCrary. She's an internal medicine physician and a physician coach. And she wrote to Kevin in the article, a word of advice from one chief resident to another. Marion, the concept, of course, of physician burnout and resident burnout has been in the forefront over the last few years. And residency programs have responded by limiting work hours and paying more attention to burnout in their medical trainees. So after reflecting over the last few years, do you think that enough has been done Is it simply more resiliency classes, more yoga classes, reducing work hours? And if not, what more needs to be done to help behavioral health aspects of our medical trainees today? Oh, there's a lot of great points there. So I think someone said to me, um, we don't want to hear about yoga anymore. Yoga is great, but you can't yoga your way out of burnout. And I'm putting together a presentation on resiliency, and I'm afraid people might throw tomatoes at me. You know, that type of thinking of we've heard this, you know, I don't know if this is going down the right path. You know, I actually was in the I was a chief resident the year the work hours change happened. So I'm dating myself now, but Mm it it. We, my chief resident, my co-chief resident and I were in charge of figuring out how we were going to revamp this program to be able to put the work hours in. And, you know, we could see the positives and negatives behind it. I think there have been some things that have been valuable for that. And then it may not have been fully what we wanted it to be. I know there's been a lot of emphasis in graduate medical education of having a wellness piece. It's mandated and how that looks in different programs in terms of what that support is. Is it a, is it a pizza lunch once a month where you talk about your uh, resiliency or your, your, what you're doing for mindfulness, or does it go beyond that? And does it involve more conversation about day to day and how to do this um, in, in real time and real life? And, and coaching, I think has been a piece that has started to make its way into that. So a lot of programs are using coaches for their residents in different capacities to really help them through some of these processes. And I think we start talking about it now with our med students and our residency trainees, Mm -hmm. then it's, 
it's hopefully, if we can do it right, it's going to change the culture of medicine as we go. And so as they, those folks from this program start to go out into all the um, places that they go, they're going to build on this and kind of mentor and teach this to the folks underneath them. And in the program I'm in, it's really interesting that there are attendings who are trained in some coaching skills, who work with residents. And so they're learning some of these different ways of uh, thinking about things, these Mm -hmm. expectations, these skills, these tools a little bit, and then they're helping the residents. So we're actually kind of catching the attendings and teaching them some of these things as well. And I think just, again, changing the, the way we think about how we train doctors, what works, what doesn't work. You know, this is something that is in flux right now. And I think that we're heading in the right direction. COVID, you know, has been so devastating for trainees and, and how they're learning and, and uh, the community has been different. Mm -hmm. And so I know that with what we're seeing now with, um, rise in in physicians leaving medicine, rise in physician suicide, you know, it's really a time to focus on this. Um, The coming up in September, depending on when this comes out before or after there, September 17th is National Physician Suicide Awareness Day. And so it's just really a time to kind of think about where, where you are in that space in your community, if your programs, your institution, and how you're supporting physicians in their wellness um, to try to avoid, you know, the ultimate loss of physicians uh, with a loss of physician life. And my final question, what's your take home message that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? You can change your expectations. You can do uh, different things, have different thoughts, figure out what serves you and really try to make that happen and not just stay, you know, in the plan, the way you think it should be. You don't always have to follow the rules. Marion, thank you again for coming back on our show, sharing your time and insight. We'll see you soon. Thank you for having me again.